Okay, so uh, let's move on to the 10th question, the paper three, okay. So the Poisson bracket of any constant of motion with the Hamiltonian H is, okay. So this is uh, something that we've done a lot before, okay, calculating the Poisson bracket. And I think we kind of like did one question uh, in the previous paper, which is kind of like similar to this. Okay, so um, basically what you have to do, you have to calculate the Poisson bracket uh, of this with respect to your, uh, you're supposed to be calculating the Poisson bracket of any function, which is a constant of motion with respect to your Hamiltonian. So basically you are supposed to calculate something like this. Okay, you're supposed to calculate, uh, say some function f with your H, okay? So that's what you're supposed to find out. And uh, what do you mean by constant of motion? Basically, when something is a constant of motion, uh, it, suppose F is a constant of motion, uh, when you take the time derivative with respect to this, you should get a zero, okay? So that means F is equal to a constant and that's what you mean by constant of motion, right? So let's kind of like explore into that a bit, okay? So the Poisson bracket F of P comma Q with respect to G is defined as such, okay? So first, what do you write? If you have an F G Poisson bracket, you put F then G and F and G, and then you, you would take it uh, as a derivative with respect to Q and then P, okay? And then P and then Q. So the upper part is like in the same order as F G, the lower part has to be reversed, okay? So you have a Q, then P, then P, then Q. Okay, so what do you do? Okay, now here we want to find out the total time derivative of this function, okay? So the function f is basically something like this. So f is basically dependent on q, uh, p, and then t, okay? So when that happens, what do you do basically? You take, it, uh, take a derivative with respect to, if you want to find out the total derivative with respect to time, you basically have to differentiate it like this. So you do a do f divided by do q, uh, do Q divided by do T plus do F divided by do P, do P divided by do T plus do F divided by do T. Okay, so this becomes a Q dot. This becomes a P dot. Okay, so you end up having a do F divided by do Q into Q dot plus do F divided by do P into a P dot plus 2f divided by dot t. And that's exactly what we have here, except for that, uh, for this case, there's kind of like taken n set of coordinates here, okay? So you have a dou f divided by dou q, a q dot plus dou f divided by dou p and p dot, okay? And then you have a dou f by dou t. Now let's kind of like move to this, okay? So uh, we kind of like, remember the Hamilton's equations, right? Dou H divided by dou P is equal to what? QK dot, okay? So dou H divided by dou PK is equal to QK dot and dou H divided by dou QK is equal to minus PK dot, okay? So we have to substitute that here. Now what happens when you try and do that? This looks like a Poisson bracket of F and H, okay? So that's what you basically getting here, except that your G is basically replaced by the Hamiltonian. Okay, so now let's look at this. So you basically replace it as a Poisson bracket and you have a DF divided by DT is equal to dou F by dou T plus F comma H. Now, if this is F is not an explicit function of time, then what happens? This term becomes zero. Okay, so if it's not explicitly dependent on time, dou H divided by dou T becomes equal to zero. And next, what happens? Now, if F is a constant of the motion, then basically your DF divided by DT is equal to zero, right? So these two things are basically not related to each other. You have to keep that in mind. One thing is basically it is not explicitly dependent on time, okay? So if there is no explicit time dependence. There can be implicit time dependence, but there is no explicit time dependence. Now, in this case, your function is a constant of the motion. And what do you mean by that? That means your F is equal to a constant, okay? And if you take a derivative of this constant with respect to time, what do you end up getting? You end up getting a zero. So you put this is equal to zero, okay? So this term is equal to zero. And what do you get finally? You get an F and H equal to zero, which is the Poisson bracket that you have, okay? So what is the value? What have they asked for basically in the question? They've asked for the Poisson bracket of any constant of motion with the Hamiltonian H is, so it's going to be zero, okay? So 
uh, that's basically it. Okay, so here you have the Poisson bracket of any constant of motion with respect to the Hamiltonian H is going to be zero. Okay, so now this I want you to be a little careful about it because there are several ways in which you can write the principle of least action. So what does your principle of least action basically tell you uh, when you integrate the Lagrangian, the, uh, the uh, value of the extremum that you are looking at is going to be zero. That particular quantity that you have is going to be zero. So the principle of least action basically says that you take the action, okay? And you kind of like take, let's say A is the action. And if you try to uh, look at the uh, variation of A, that is should be, a, that should be in minimum, okay? So let's look at what this is. Okay, so they've asked for the principle of yeast action in terms of the arc length of the particle of the tra particle trajectory. Okay, so that, there are several different forms of your principle of least action. Uh, we'll kind of like go through all of them and then I'll tell you what the answer is. Okay, so uh, what do you basically mean by your principle of least action? Okay, so when your particle of fixed energy travels from a point A to a point B, its tra trajectory is such that the corresponding action has the minimum possible value, okay? So what is the definition of action? The action is basically denoted by S, okay? Some books denoted as A, some books denoted as S. Now it's defined as the integral of the Lagrangian L between two incidents of time. So what are you looking at? The variation of this S should be minimal, okay? As what we're kind of like looking at. So S is basically the integral of the Lagrangian, okay? And now let's go to this, okay? So this is um, a particular uh, way to write the principle of least action. There are several ways to write it, okay? So this was given by Mark Trupus. And according to the principle of least action for a conservative system, basically you have a variation and then you take the integral and this is how the uh, L is written down okay so there is a derivation which kind of like transforms uh, this form of l to this one okay so uh basically if you want to look at it i can share it with you but what i'm going to do is uh basically tell you all the different forms and then we'll kind of like select from there which is like the correct one okay so according to the principle of least action for a conservative system the variation of the integral from t1 to t2 summation of k pk qk dot dt is equal to zero okay so now this w i think we've kind of like come across this term called the hamilton's characteristic function before okay so i think you've come across it as w itself okay uh, is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 summation of pk qk dot dt so i want you to go back and look at the previous uh, presentation slides and look at this hamilton's characteristic function okay so i think i should probably give a couple of homeworks uh, otherwise this is going to be a little hard to kind of like proceed with okay so um okay so the first thing that i want you to do is go back and re revisit the question on hamilton's characteristic function okay now uh, let's look at the other forms of principle of least action so now these are particular forms okay so there are conditions involved in these systems okay so for your conservative system the hamiltonian is a constant and the potential energy is independent of time okay so the hamilton is a hamiltonian is a constant and the potential energy is independent of time in that case when you're taking l which is equal to t minus v okay so basically what are you looking at you're looking at the integral of the lagrangian with respect to time right so here basically it is independent of time so when you're doing t minus v you can basically ignore this part okay and you can take dt integral of dt okay so uh, that is one form that we have okay not relevant here okay now the next one that we're looking at is if there is no external force in the system the kinetic energy t as well as the total energy which will be conserved so if that is the case, what's going to happen is basically this uh, term that we have here, okay, it's going to go away and then you can just take, look at it in terms of time. And this basically is a principle called the Fermat's uh, theorem in, uh, uh, in optics, okay. So I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called 
the Fermat's principle in geometrical optics. So basically the idea is that a ray of light travels between two points along a path such that the time taken is the extremum. So these are under specific conditions. Okay. So the, this basically involves principle of least action for a conservative system with constant Hamiltonian. If the kinetic energy is also uh, conserved because there is no external force in the system, then we are able to do something like this called the Fermat's principle. Okay. So next let's go on to the other forms of least action. Okay. So one of the form that we have here in particular, okay, is similar to this. Okay. It's called the Jacobi's form of the least action principle. This form of the principle of least action is related with the path of the system rather than the pot, rather than its motion in time. Okay. So it's related to the pot where the system is rather than the time. Okay. So this is how it looks. I'm not going to do the derivation here. If you want it, you want to know how it looks like, then you, you can get back to me on it, but I will not do the derivation. It takes quite some bit of time. Okay. So the variation of the integral T1 to T2 root of two H minus V, which is a function of the position into D rho. D rho is basically the element of the path length in space. Okay. So now since you've seen this out, okay. I want you to go back and look at the question now. Okay. So we kind of like see that it is coming to uh, H minus V. Okay. So we kind of like saw this now, but it is not in the exact same form. Okay. Uh, so we will look at the next one, which is similar to the Jacobi's form. Okay. So this is the Jacobi's form of least action principle, where you have the variation of the integral root of two H minus V of Q into D rho. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another form called the principle of least action in terms of arc length of the particle trajectory. So that is exactly what is given in the question. Okay. So what you will realize is there is a similarity between this Jacobi's form of the least action principle and the principle of least action in terms of arc length and particle trajectory. Okay, so let's look at this. De the variation over here is basically two times m, okay, into h minus v ds. So ds is basically the arc length that you have, okay, the element of arc travels by the particle in that particular time. So this, this is basically, if you take out this root of 2m, it really doesn't matter because the particle mass is going to be a constant. So you end up having something like the variation of root of h minus v ds is equal to zero. Okay, so let's go back and look at the question. Okay, so what you see here is the variation of this integral root of h minus v dou s is equal to zero. Okay, so that's the uh, whole idea that, uh, that I don't think we have kind of like done this derivation in our syllabus. Okay. Uh, but if you want the material for it, I can give it to you. Okay. So what you kind of like see here is this Jacobi's form and this form is basically very similar to each other. Okay. So it's exactly the same thing except for the notations. If you look at it carefully. Okay. So let's move on to this. If the effective potential energy for a radial motion is V effective of R, the condition for stability in radial motion is given by, okay, the existence of local minimum VRF at R is equal to R naught and uh, dou V effective divided by dou R squared less than zero at R is equal to R naught. So which of the following is correct? Okay. So one and two are false. One and two are correct. One is false and two is correct. One is correct and two is false. Okay, so this, what I want you to do is I want you to like look at this from the point of view of maxima and minima. Okay, so how do you basically test for whether you have a minima or maxima? You basically look at the second derivative test, right? The first thing that you look at is if the derivative itself at that point is going to be zero. And then you look at the points that you have, you substitute the points in the second derivative, look at if it's less than or greater than zero and then get the maxima and minima. And we've done this a lot of times. Okay. So uh, we've done it in BSC. We've done it. I don't know if we've done it uh, in, uh, in 10th and all, but uh, usually I think uh, the ICSE syllabus kind of does this. So let's, 
look at this okay so let's look at the second derivative test for local minima okay so the second derivative may be used to determine local extrema of a function under certain conditions okay if a function is a critical point f prime of x equal to zero and the second derivative is positive then it has a local minima so what i want you to remember is positive then you have a minima if you have a negative second derivative that comes up you have a maxima okay so those are the two important points here how if the function is a critical point f prime of x is equal to zero and the second derivative is negative at this point then f has a local maxima here okay so let's go back and look at this okay so the existence of a local minima at v r f is at r is equal to r naught is basically dependent on whether the derivative of that is equal to zero okay so that is a whole idea here not looking at just this particular value now here what you have is you have a dou squared v effective of r divided by dou r squared less than zero at r is equal to r naught so what are you looking at here basically it should be a negative value right that's what you're basically looking at here negative value if it's less than zero it's going to be negative but what have we learned we have learned that if it's negative it should imply that it is a maximum maxima okay so if it is a maxima then you're not basically going to be getting a minimum okay so the stability condition basically depends on if that value is minimum is a minima okay so basically we have uh, we have uh, one is correct and two is false okay so this is wrong but this is correct okay so if you have a point say r is equal to r naught then you end up having this v r effective that you have so how do you basically find out the critical points you find out the critical points by taking v prime effective of r right and then we substitute and we get this r naught okay so this is uh, the idea that i have kind of like or uh, kind of like a trick to kind of like solve this problem quickly okay so let's look at the next question i think we've discussed about lama formula in formula in detail okay so la uh, for the last uh, paper so basically what does your lama formula give you it basically gives you power radiated by a point charge power radiated by an accelerated charge of a particle is what your option is so let's just review the formula once more okay so when you look at lama formula basically you should end up getting power radiated by a point charge the lama formula is used to calculate the total power radiated by non relativistic point charge as it accelerates okay so this is how it's written this is p is equal to mu not q squared a squared divided by 6 pi c i think this is something that you should remember okay so that's why i kind of like put it out again now what is your a a is basically the proper acceleration q is your charge c is your speed of light so it's it's quite easy to remember to i feel like so you have a mu not q squared a squared divided by 6 pi c okay so now uh, this is i think is a familiar question okay you might have done it in your uh, bsc the dispersive relation for a low density plasma is omega squared is equal to omega not plus c squared k squared where omega not is the plasma frequency and c is the speed of light in the free space the relation between the group velocity vg and phase velocity vp is okay so let's look at this okay so these are the different options that are given to you you're automatically going to try and tick this up but let's not look at it that way okay so let's look at uh, the definition of group velocity and phase velocity first okay so the group velocity of a wave is the velocity with which it the overall envelope of the wave's amplitude okay propagates through space so it's the group velocity grouped together okay now what is the phase velocity the phase velocity of a wave is the rate at which the wave propagates in some medium this velocity is basically related to one of the phase of the it's related to the frequency component of is looking at basically the frequency component one frequency component phase of that one frequency component so basically if you're looking at light you have several frequency components that are coming up 
And here, what it's doing is it's basically looking at one fre particular frequency component of that set of frequency components that you have in light. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so the group velocity VG is basically defined by this equation. So it's written as dou omega divided by dou k. Now, uh, let me just go back to the question and write down what the dispersion relation is. Okay. So this is omega squared is equal to omega naught plus c squared k squared, right? This is the dispersion relation. Now let's look at this. Okay, so we have a dou omega divided by dou k. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find the group velocity from this. So I'm going to differentiate this with respect to k. So I get a 2 omega dou omega divided by dou k is equal to omega naught. Okay, so this basically becomes zero when I differentiate it because it's omega naught and then I get a c squared into 2k. So I cancel this out, I get a dou omega divided by dou k, which is equal to c squared k divided by omega. Now what you'll realize is what is this? This is basically the vg that you have. This is basically one divided by v, uh, we have vp okay so this is the phase velocity so you end up getting vg vp is equal to c squared and that's option c that we have okay so let's just look at this okay so omega here is the wave's angular frequency k is the angular number this is how your phase velocity is defined vp is equal to omega divided by k so i think this is fairly easy to remember if you have a g you end up having a dou if you don't have a g, you end up just writing omega divided by k. Now, the function omega k is basically the, the, yeah. So, we basically use the dispersion relation now to kind of like find it out. So, this function omega of k, which gives omega as a function of k, is called the dispersion relation. Okay. So, this is how basically it looks like. The g refers to the entire thing as a group. Okay. So how the entire wave is moving through and VP basically refers to the phase of one of the frequency components that you have in this wave. Okay. Okay. So let's move. Okay. So this is all the calculation that we kind of like did quickly. Okay. So you can go through it again. Okay. So let's move on to this. The pointing vector S is defined as, okay, so I think you know this pretty well, but I just want to discuss about the various different forms that you can have for a pointing vector. Okay, so basically, what do you mean by your pointing vector? It's basically the energy per unit time per unit area, okay? So let's look at this, okay? So what do you look at when you're looking at your pointing vector? It basically represents a directional energy flux. So that basically means the energy transfer per unit area per unit time. So let's write watt per unit area per unit time. Okay, so watt basically is joules per second. So joules and second. So you have a joules meter square Okay, meter minus two, S minus one. And that can also be written as watt per meter square. So when you're looking at your pointing vector, the units are basically this, okay? So let's look at this, okay? Watt per meter square is your unit. Now let's look at this. This is basically the standard form that you have for your pointing vector, E cross H. And this is the most used form, okay? So whenever you start writing it, you write it in terms of, you know, you usually use this, notation okay so e is your electric field h is the magnetic field's auxiliary field vector okay or the magnetic intensity and this is basically called the abraham form okay so this form is called the abraham form and there are several other forms that we come across and basically it's just related to one thing so if you look at your e e is basically epsilon d vector that you have right and when you look at your h you basically have b vector divided by mu naught so it's just a variation of these D's and B's that you have when you're looking at the different forms of the pointing vector, okay? So, yeah, okay, so let's look at the four forms. So this is the Abraham form, which is the most common form that is used, E cross H. Then you have one with your electric current, okay? So E cross B, then the magnetic current form, so that's a D cross H, and the other form is called the Minkowski form. 
okay so that's d cross b so it's just variations of these electric fields and magnetic field density and each of them have their own particular use at some place okay so um, let's just look at this again so the point a vector s is defined as the energy per unit area per unit time so i think you should probably get to this idea if you know the unit of your point a vector you can kind of like automatically find this out okay so what meter uh, raised to minus two so you know that what is basically joule second by uh, joule per second so that's going to be joule per second per meter square and this should give you energy per unit time per unit area okay so let's move on to the next one okay so this is i think we talked about transmission lines earlier so i feel like this is a very common question that they ask they're asking a lot of questions of transmission lines so this is something that was there in the communication systems chapter in your 12th standard okay so i think you should probably go and look at transmission lines like like just solve a set of questions on transmission lines so i have a set of questions on transmission lines just for like a pdf on transmission lines so if you get back to me and let me know i will send that across okay so a transmission line whose characteristic impedance is a pure resistance there's a lot of typo in these questions so this particular question has a typo okay so i want you to be very careful with that so the transmission line whose characteristic impedance is a pure resistance must be a lossless line must be a distortionless line uh, may be a lossless line may not be a distortionless line so what we need to know is we need to know the condition for lossless and we need to know the condition for distortionless okay so when we are looking at lossless i think we discussed this earlier you had a g is equal to zero r is equal to zero so let's look at the circuit diagram for your transmission line first okay so this is how your uh, transmission lossless transmission line basically looks okay uh, this is how your transmission line looks so you want to find out what the lossless transmission line basically means is your r and g are going to be zero okay so that's what your lossless transmission line means but this is not a lossless transmission line okay don't get me wrong this is not a lossless transmission line if you want to find the characteristic impedance of a lossless transmission line you basically equate this g and r to zero okay so let's look at this now what they've kind of like given in the question is let's just read that again the characteristic impedance should be a pure resistance so what they're saying is basically you just have to have a z not equal to r okay so that's what they're kind of like saying so let's just look at this okay so this is how your z not is defined for your transmission line so i think you can do that you can just do uh you know like uh the r that you have here this two components are in series these two components are in parallel so you just kind of like uh do that uh you kind of like uh add this up and kind of like find the impedance of this okay so let's look at this uh with your z naught as a prior resistance so basically you should not have any j components okay so your z naught should be equal to r that's what you want now if you look at a lossless condition g is equal to zero and r is equal to zero now if that is the case if your r is equal to zero your your z naught becomes zero automatically okay but what have they actually told you they want the characteristic impedance to have a pure resistance not just go off to zero okay so this cannot be lossless okay so it cannot be lossless okay now let's look at the next question okay so this i think we kind of like did okay well we kind of like had to find the velocity uh, at which the you know the data passes through in the transmission line okay so that's what we had to do in the previous question now what i'm going to talk to you about is the distortionless condition okay so for condition for that is basically z naught should be equal to r divided by g is equal to l divided by c okay so this is the condition for that so i think uh, i told you that g is basically your shunt resistance so what they want is an r divided by g equal to l divided by c now here what you have is basically when your characteristic line is a pure resistance the line must be a distortionless line okay but it cannot be a lossless line okay so what you should have had here is 
it may not be a lossless line is what you should have had okay not may be a lossless line but may not okay so they kind of like messed up the options okay so it may not be a lossless line is what you should have had okay why because it cannot be a lossless line but it can be a distortionless line okay so yeah this is what i have there okay so be very careful about that okay so this is should this should be a not there is a goof up in the question that they've given this should have a not here okay so let's move on to the next question Okay, so let's look at this question. The velocity factor of a transmission line depends on the dielectric constant of the material used, increases the velocity along the transmission line, is governed by skin effect, is higher for a solid dielectric than air. Okay, so let's look at this. Okay, so first let's look at what V basically is. So V can be written as 1 divided by root of mu, no, mu epsilon. Okay, so if you look at the speed of light in vacuum, it's basically written as mu naught epsilon naught. If you're looking at a medium without any magnetic interaction, I can write this mu as mu naught. Okay, so V is equal to 1 divided by root of mu naught epsilon. And what do you have here? Okay, so let's kind of like write this V in terms of the C. So V is equal to 1 divided by root of mu naught epsilon is basically epsilon naught epsilon r okay so that means i can write v is equal to one divided by uh, root of epsilon r and this entire thing will basically be my c so i will write this as c divided by root of epsilon r so i have got a v is equal to c divided by root of epsilon r and what is epsilon r it's a relative permittivity which is also called as the dielectric constant so basically V is equal to C divided by root of K is what we have. And what do we have here? The velocity factor of a transmission line. It really doesn't matter uh, that you have a transmission line that's given here. So the easiest way to go about it is basically looking at the speed of light in a medium. Okay. So you're looking at the velocity of light in a medium. We're, here we are looking at the transmission of the electromagnetic wave, right, through the transmission line. So basically, it depends on the dielectric constant of the material that is used. Okay. So let's look at this. Okay. So the speed of electromagnetic waves propagating through a dielectric medium is given by this. C prime is equal to C divided by root of K. So this was basically your V. This is your epsilon R. Okay. Root of epsilon R that you have there. And then what do you have? You have all these. Okay. Given G. Okay. So now let's look at this question that we have. Okay, so this question, I'm going to give you a homework. And I, I want you to basically look at this uh, carefully, okay? So because uh, I, I, I'm supposing that you should have done this uh, in your second semester, okay? But if you haven't, or if, if you had a different teacher or things like that, uh, I will kind of like want you to do this okay so i'll probably ask people to submit it okay so you should probably work it out and submit it okay because otherwise people just like kind of like never do it so i want you to work it out and submit it okay so let's look at this according to the Dirac's relativistic theory orbital angular momentum is a constant of motion a central force field vanishes in a central force field is not a constant of motion in a central force field is a parameter in a central force field okay so let's look at this okay so now let's look at the non-relativistic free particle hamiltonian so h cap is equal to p square divided by 2m we see that it computes with the orbital angular momentum and how do you know that so orbital angular momentum is l vector is equal to r cross p okay so now if you kind of like substitute these you can kind of like get this as zero so i think i told you how to remember this okay so if you want to find out what your lx is the next thing that you write is a y pz minus z py okay so what i want you to do is this is one homework that's given to you you will take this hamiltonian okay so you have a px squared okay 
Px squared divided by 2m. And I want you to find out the commutator with respect to this. Okay, you'll realize it should be a zero. Okay, after you do that calculation. Now, that was for the free non relativistic free particle Hamiltonian. What was given to you in the question? In the question they've kind of like asked you according to Dirac's relativistic theory. So you're supposed to be using the Dirac Hamiltonian over here. Okay, so what does the Dirac Hamiltonian look like? So this is how the Dirac Hamiltonian looks like. So C alpha vector dotted with P vector plus beta MC squared is what you have. So you verify the Dirac's relativistic Hamiltonian with your, uh, if the uh, Dirac's relativistic Hamiltonian commutes with your L. So what you're supposed to do is basically you want to find out H Dirac and you look at L. Okay, so these are the, this is what I want you to calculate. Okay, so you need to take this. Okay, and then you need to find out if it gets, uh, if you get a, uh, if it commutes with the value. If not, what is the value of that commutator is what I want. Okay, so you'll realize it's not equal to zero. Now, we kind of like discussed today's question where we had something like this. We had an F okay and uh, a h okay so that was the poisson bracket but what you'll kind of like realize is if it is a constant of the motion okay your commutator is going to be zero as well okay so that's what you kind of like realize so let's look at this so the shorthand notation for all three components together is basically h cap l is equal to minus i h cross c alpha vector crossed with the p vector so this is what you basically have here, okay? So this is not equal to zero. Because it's not equal to zero, this value of L is not a constant of the motion, okay? So what do you have? This means that the Dirac Hamiltonian does not commute with the orbital angular momentum operator. So what do you see? This means that the orbital angular momentum is not a constant for Dirac's relativistic free particle. So that's what you have in this question basically, okay? So here you realize it is not a constant of motion in a central force field for the Dirac's relativistic theory, but it is a constant of the motion if you look at your free particle Hamiltonian, okay? So this is the homework that you have, okay? So I want you to verify if the Dirac's relativistic Hamiltonian commutes with your help, okay? And uh, I don't know how the others are going to do it, but let's see. Okay, so I'll probably just notify in the group or something. I want this submitted, like this part submitted, because I think this is a part where a lot of people ignore it and really don't look through it because they think it's really easy, but I want you to work it through. Okay. Okay, so I think we've kind of like, uh, you might have done this in the second semester. Okay, so this WKB approximation is basically referred to as what is it? Okay, it's classical approximation, quantum approximation, semi-classical approximation, or weak approximation. I will tell you why it is basically called the semi-classical approximation. Okay, so this is a method uh, called the Wenzel, Kramers, and Brillouin method. Okay, it's called the Brillouin method or the Brillouin approximation, and it is basically a method that is used for finding approximate solutions to linear differential equations with spatially varying coefficients, okay? So I think you might have uh, like looked through this, okay? So here, what do we basically do, okay? It's used for semi-classical calculation, okay? And I think you've kind of like done this part, okay? So you're looking at an amplitude that is changing slowly, okay? I think you have done this approximation, I think. SB ma'am kind of like really explained about this. She said, you're looking at an amplitude that is, or, or your face, that is taken to be changing slowly. And that is your WKB approximation that you're looking at, okay? So it is not, it is kind of like a semi-classical approximation that you use in quantum mechanics. So what you do is you take the wave function and you put it back as an exponential function, okay? And then you expand that function, okay? Semi-classically. So that's the whole idea. I want to stress this point out a lot. Okay. Amplitude here is taken to be changing slowly. Okay. So now this is another name for this is your Lyoville Green method. Okay. And there is usually somebody else that comes up in this picture. Okay. Not just Wenzel, Kramer, or Bluon. 
another person called Jeffries is also, you know, like coming into the picture. So it's sometimes called JWKB or WKBJ. Okay. So uh, you, you'll never know. You might get variants of these questions coming up. Okay. And then you might get confused. Why is this J here? Is it a typo and things like that? Okay. So let's look at this question. Uh, this, um, I have the derivation with me, but I don't think it's really essential for you right now. Okay. Uh, I think you should just basically look at uh, the scattering amplitude that is being given to you. Okay. So if you want the derivation for this, I'll give it to you. This is extensively, partial wave analysis extensively used in nuclear. So I'm kind of like really familiar with it. All the nuclear elective students are basically really familiar with it. But if you uh, do not, if you want to know more about it, let me know and I'll pass on the derivation. Okay, so in partial wave analysis, the expression for total cross-section of scattering is, okay, so these are the variants that we have. Okay, so PL, I think they should really put a bracket here because this is like nonsense, writing the genre polynomials like this. Okay, so you need to put that up and I think you can kind of like eliminate it because you don't get a PL squared coming up anywhere. Okay. So let's look at the, okay. So what do you basically mean by partial wave analysis? So it's used for solving scattering problems. Okay. And what you're basically doing is you're splitting up each of the waves. Okay. So each L that you're looking at your angular momentum component, you're basically splitting it up into several of those partial functions that we have. Okay. So that's why it's called partial wave analysis. Okay. So what you're doing is you're taking a plane wave and you're writing it in terms of these split components. Okay. You're writing it as a summation of these split components. So this is how your plane wave basically looks. Okay. So this is your Bessel function that's there and you kind of like do a little bit of manipulation with all of that and you end up getting something called the F theta K, which is called your scattering amplitude. Now to find out your cross section, what you're supposed to be differential cross section, but maybe more specific about that. So if you want to find out your differential cross section, what you do is you square the scattering amplitude. And once you square the scattering amplitude, you can basically simplify it into this and do all the calculations that are there. Okay. So uh, I just want to give this formula to you like this for now, because that derivation takes like an hour or two to actually do it. Okay. So if you want to look at it, let me know. I will send it for you. Okay. So this is basically the first option that we have. Okay. So important, I think the th key thing here is you're taking the plane wave, splitting it up into partial waves. Okay. And then you're kind of like squaring uh, the, uh, the scattering amplitude and getting the differential cross section. So this is basically the main idea how you go about it. Okay. Okay. So now I think you've learned about Gamow's theory of alpha decay. Okay. So what does it basically tell you? If you're looking at your Gamow's theory of alpha decay, basically it tells you that how alpha emission occurs is through quantum tunneling. So Gamow actually kind of like related this alpha decay to quantum tunneling and got back an empirical formula that uh, was just uh, was uh, kind of like proposed by Geiger. It's called the geiger nothel equation. Okay, so we will kind of like look at that. Okay, so alpha emission is the example of barrier reflection, barrier tunneling, barrier refraction or barrier absorption. Okay, so uh, basically what your alpha decay is, is it's a quantum tunneling process. Okay, so this is basically what is discussed in Gamow's theory of alpha decay. And unlike your beta decay, it basically looks into both your nuclear force as well as electromagnetic force. So beta decay is basically governed by weak interactions, right? Now in this case, um, wait, weak interactions are violated in beta decay, okay? So here, unlike that, you basically have your nuclear force and electromagnetic force, basically, you know, you have an interplay of both of them. Now here, your George Gamow had solved the theory of your alpha decay via tunneling. And what he did was, he basically trapped this alpha particle in a potential well, okay? And classically what happens is you cannot escape that potential well. That's what happens classically. But because of the theories that were discovered during that time, okay? The principles of tunneling that was discovered, he was able to see that uh, it was able to tunnel through and appear on the other side 
to escape the nucleus. So that's what he kind of like uh, looked at. And he kind of like discovered that alpha, alpha DK is basically based on this principle of quantum tunneling. Okay. So what he did was he kind of like, we actually did this derivation. Okay. So you had this gamma, uh, you kind of like had this in the syllabus, actually this topic in the syllabus. So gamma solved a model potential for the nucleus and derived from your first principles, a relation between the half-life of the DK and the energy of emission, which had been discovered empirically. And this was called the geiger nuttall law. So I think what you do is in this derivation that we kind of like did, you basically do something like ln of lambda or ln of tau, I think. And then you kind of like relate it to one by E squared and you get something like this. You get some kind of a function like this. So this I think is like the half-life that we get. Lifetime. Okay. So that's the lifetime that we get. And that's what we actually did in our derivation. Okay, so the geiger nuttall law is basically written like this. Okay, so you can see that the log of lambda is, okay, so the log of lambda is basically proportional to the uh, inverse of the square root of your energy. Okay, so this is what we came across finally. Okay. So now let's look at this. So lambda is equal to ln divided by, uh, ln of 2 divided by your half-life, and then you have your atomic number. This is your total kinetic energy and you have A1 and A2S constants. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, next question. Okay, so I, what I want to explain to you about is about two concepts called spontaneous emission and uh, stimulated emission. So this is basically how your lasers work. Okay, what do you mean by your laser? Your laser is basically uh, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay, so um, what is your spontaneous emission? Okay, so let's look at spontaneous emission. Okay, so what you have in spontaneous emission is basically you have an atom here at this energy level E1 and E2. Now, if there is some photon that incidents on this, okay, with an energy equivalent to delta E equal to H nu, what's going to happen? This atom is going to go up, okay? And this atom is going to go up and it's going to stay there for a little while. Okay. That is called uh, stimulated absorption. Okay. So basically you have a photon of H nu coming in here and then it's going to go up. Now, uh, let's look at this. Okay. So now it's excited and it's all there. Now, after a while, it's going to come down. Okay. So after a while, it's going to come down and it's going to give you something that some kind of a photon with energy H nu. And this is called spontaneous emission. Okay, that's spontaneous emission and we're done with it. Okay, why is it called spontaneous emission? Because it happens spontaneously without any other interaction. Okay, so let's look at the next thing. Okay, so let's remove all this. Okay. Now what I want to talk to you about is stimulated emission. In this case, we're already talking about an excited atom. Okay, an atom which is already at a level e2 okay so if that is the case what's going to happen this guy let's say another photon of h nu already comes and hits this already excited atom okay so another photon of h nu comes and hits this already excited atom so what we kind of like realize is there is going to be two at two photons that are going to be coming out and this guy is going to fall back to here okay so it's going to fall back here and what we kind of like realize is, okay, so that's gone. Okay, so what do we kind of like realize? We're realizing that these two photons that are there are coherent, okay? So these are coherent sources of light. So that's basically how your laser works, okay? Laser works because of stimulated emission, okay? So what are we looking at? When we're looking at a laser, we're looking at a coherent source. What do you mean by coherence? So basically, you're looking at something with all the same wavelengths. Okay, that's what a coherence means. So basically, what you're going to do is you're going to take this H nu, and what's going to happen? It's going to hit another atom later on, and then you're going to have two more come up. Okay, and then these are going to be hitting other sets. Okay, and then you have so many other uh, uh, coherent sources of light coming up. Okay. And then I think what they do in lasers is they kind of like put mirrors 
and they kind of like amplify this whole thing like they make this kind of like hit each other back and forth and then you end up getting a nice coherent source and they kind of like decrease the reflectivity of this mirror and then you kind of like get your uh, get your uh, coherent source photons out from here so that's how your laser works now what are you looking at when you're looking at these einstein a and b coefficients okay so one of them is related to your spontaneous emission and the other one is related to your stimulated emission okay so let's this is basically a having all the wrong options okay this is not the ratio that's actually there so let's just look at the correct version okay so okay so he einstein basically gave this a uh, probability that is there between your spontaneous emission and the stimulated emission okay so it's given by this um, basically this is gotten from the formula of your black body radiation okay so um, let's just look at this for now okay so let's look at 8 pi h nu cube divided by c cube now i want to convert this in terms of angular momentum and h bar okay so what i will do is i will multiply I will divide this h bar divided by 2 pi and then I will take an 8 pi and multiply it with a 2 pi and I get a new cube divided by c cube. Okay, so this becomes a h bar. Okay, and this becomes 16 pi squared nu cube divided by c cube. Now, this and this have to be grouped together. Okay, so I will take this h bar over here and I want to write uh, this omega. Basically, you end up having omega is equal to 2 pi nu. So I want to write nu is equal to omega divided by 2 pi. So I write omega divided by 2 pi whole cubed divided by c cubed. Okay. And then I have a 16 pi square here. Now let's look at this. This becomes an 8 pi cubed. Okay. And I will cancel this out. So I get a pi at the bottom and I get a 2 at the top. So I get a 2 h cross omega cubed divided by c cubed. Okay. So what I will do is I will erase all of these. Okay. And I will leave that there and I will show you what went wrong with the options. Okay. So this is a question they kind of like gave grace marks for. Okay. So let's look at this. So do you have any of these options coming up here? You'll kind of like realize you do not have an omega uh, cube. So all these options are kind of like wrong. Okay. So this is the correct answer that you have. Okay, so let's move on to this. Okay, so the relativistic relation for the total energy E of a particle with rest mass m0 is, so this you automatically kind of like say P squared C squared plus m0 squared C to the power of 4 is equal to E squared. Okay, so this you will kind of like automatically say, nonetheless, let me just take you through uh, how to go about it. Okay, so here you have a particle of rest mass m0 moving with your velocity v and then an energy associated with it is basically given by mc squared which is equal to m0. You basically write it in terms of your rest mass. Okay, and then what you do is you kind of like uh, write p is equal to mv. So you end up writing v in terms of p. Okay, write it in terms of momentum and then you kind of like have to square these two sides. So you better get an e square is equal to m naught squared c to the power of 4 divided by 1 minus p squared c squared divided by m squared c to the power of 4 and then you take this to this side okay so you end up getting e squared into 1 minus p squared c squared divided by m squared c to the power of 4 is equal to m naught squared c to the power of 4 and what i want you to do is this is a homework i want you to kind of like simplify this and get back to me on it okay so i want you to get P is equal to p squared c squared plus m naught squared c to the power of 4 okay so there's a lot of homework today and none not many have joined but anyway let's just let's just go forth with it okay so i want you to kind of like transfer this equation into this and there is some particular condition that you have to use okay so so get back to me on that okay so um Let's look at this. Okay, I think we discussed about the Born approximation last time. Okay, so the Born approximation, uh, the effective cross section of the scattering amplitude depends on. Okay, so one of the things that you do is you use the Born approximation in a Coulomb potential. 
and you kind of like to drive the Rutherford scattering formula. So if you remember that even vaguely, you would end up getting, you would end up directly picking this option up. So you remember that there's going to be a cosine of theta by two whole power four that's there. And you also will see a uh, P power four dependence uh, that is there. So let me just go through that. Okay. So the integral form of your potential scattering is more suitable in your scattering experiments. Okay. So the benefit of the integral equation is basically it applies throughout the whole volume. Okay. So the integral form is suitable for successive approximation. And the Born approximation is basically valid for large incident energies and weak scattered potentials, which basically refers to Lozen. And I think this was the question that we had before. Okay. So they kind of like ask, when is the Born approximation valid? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is your Born approximation for the Coulomb potential gives you a Rutherford's formula. And this is how your Rutherford's formula looks. Now what you will kind of like realize is your energy is proportional to P squared, right? E is something, you have something like P squared divided by 2M. So you end up getting a P power 4 here at the denominator and you end up having a sine power 4 theta by 2. And that's what's exactly given there, okay? So what have they given there in the question? They're basically given in the Born approximation, the effective cross-section of the scattering amplitude depends on, which is basically your Rutherford scattering formula, okay? P and theta in combination P sine theta by 2 in the combination P sine theta by two. So it's not in any combination. It is in this particular combination P sine theta divided by two that it's P and theta are, uh, are, I mean, like the cross section is dependent on, okay? So it's not just the momentum, it's not just theta. It is both P and theta in this kind of a format, okay? So you kind of like realize that from the uh, Rutherford scattering formula that is given to you. And I think, you kind of like derived it without using much of quantum mechanics and like your BSc and all. Like, I think you would have uh, finally got something like cos cosecant uh, power four theta by two or something like that. So you would have written it in this form, okay? But you realize it's kind of like the same thing. Okay, and I think you would have done it uh, uh, this semester too. I mean like in the second semester too. <laughs> 